Good morning. My name is Mary Glantz, and I am a senior advisor in USIP's Center for Russia and Europe. Thank you for joining us. One year ago, on February 24th, Russia launched a new offensive against Ukraine. This latest stage in Russia's decade-long war against its neighbor wrought violence and destruction on a scale unseen in Europe since World War II. Hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians and Russians have been killed or wounded, with over 10,000 of those being Ukrainian civilians. Over 8 million Ukrainians have become refugees, and 6 million have become internally displaced. And in Russia, 500,000 people have fled the country. While the brunt of this brutal the brutality of this war has been visited upon Ukraine, its impact has been felt far beyond that epicenter. Russia has been roiled by mobilizations, sanctions, and an increasingly authoritarian regime opposed to any criticism of its war effort, including efforts to describe what it euphemistically calls a special military operation as a war. Europe has taken in refugees, supplied weapons and assistance, and dealt with the impact of sanctions. The entire world has felt the, economic, the impact economically most notably in food prices and shortages, and in new pressures on the international system. Today, we are fortunate to have gathered a panel of experts who can speak to the varied impacts of this war. Ambassador Marie Yovanovitch is a senior advisor in USIP's Center for Russia and Europe and a senior fellow in the Russia and Eurasia program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. She is also a non-resident fellow at the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy of Georgetown University. Previously, she served as U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine, the Republic of Armenia, and the Kyrgyz Republic. Among other assignments in her distinguished diplomatic career, she served as Dean of the School of Language Studies at the Foreign Service Institute and as the Deputy Commandant and International Advisor at the Dwight D. Eisenhower School for National Security and Resource Strategy of the National Defense University. Earlier, she served as the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of European and Eurasian Affairs, where she co coordinated policy on European and global security issues. Maria Snegovaya is a senior fellow for Russia and Eurasia with the Europe, Russia, and Eurasia program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies and a postdoctoral fellow in Georgetown University's Walsh School of Foreign Service. She studies Russia's domestic and foreign policy as well as democratic backsliding in post-communist Europe and the tactics used by Russian actors and proxies who exploit these dynamics in the region. Her analysis has been published in multiple policy and peer-reviewed journals. Her research and commentary have appeared in a number of publications, such as the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, The Economist, and Foreign Policy. Throughout her career, she has collaborated with multiple US research centers and think tanks, such as Center for a New Euro Europe American Security and Center for European Policy Analysis. She holds a PhD in political science from Columbia University. Lise Howard is a senior scholar in residence with USIP's Russia and Ukraine team for the 2022-2023 academic year. She is a tenured professor of government and foreign service at Georgetown University and president of the Academic Council on the United Nations System. Her research and teaching interests span the fields of international relations, comparative politics, and conflict resolution. She has previously held year-long fellowships at Stanford University, Harvard University, and the University of Maryland. She is fluent in French and Russian and speaks some Bosnian, Croatian, Serbian, Spanish, and German. Prior to her career in academia, she served as acting director of UN Affairs for the New York City Commission for the United Nations. She earned her master's and doctorate in political science from University of California, Berkeley, and her bachelor's in Soviet studies from Barnard College at Columbia University. She holds certificates in philology and law from what is now St. Petersburg State University in Russia. Her first book, UN Peacekeeping and Civil Wars, won an award from the Academic Council on the US, UN System in 2010. Her other book, Power and Peacekeeping, won the 2020 Best Book Award from the International Security Studies Section of the International Studies Association.
We are really grateful to have them here to discuss with us the impact of this war on Ukraine, on Europe, and on the international system. Um, we will begin with a brief discussion and conversation in which I will ask them questions and we'll discuss their thoughts on the war. And then I will turn to the audience, both online, you can submit your questions online or here in person um, for a brief question and answer period. Thank you. You recently returned from a trip to Ukraine. Can you discuss your observations during your visit? Yeah. So <clears throat> I was in um, Ukraine really only for two days, um, and it was in Kyiv, the capital, um, on uh, the uh, 23rd and the 24th. So we were there for the anniversary. And um, you know it was kind of a, a difficult decision to make whether or not to go, but in the end, I'm glad I did because even though you know the president of the United States had been there, just been there, um, bipartisan uh, congressional delegations, all sorts of world leaders, um, the Ukrainians um, really appreciate all of the support that they can get from all of their friends, and making that journey, um, you know, signals we are we are we are with you. Um, the Ukrainian people are still. Um, you know, as uh, united and resilient as ever in fighting back against, um, against Russian aggression in all of its many forms. Um, and they are courageous and they are confident of victory. But the, uh, the big um, impression that I got, which is not gonna be new to this audience, is that they're also tired. You know, the soldiers are tired. They have not had a break in a year. Um, and the population is tired as well. Um, you know, they are gonna keep on going, um, in part because they believe, they believe in Ukraine, they believe in their freedom, they believe in their families, um, and they have no choice uh, because this is an existential war. If they stop fighting, Russia will either russify them or kill them, and so there is no other choice than to keep on fighting, and they will do that. Um, but I think what they need from us, and this was, you know, expressed by everybody, starting, uh, of course, with President Zelensky, and again, this is not gonna be a surprise to this audience, is more assistance. They are grateful for everything the United States and the international community is providing, whether it is um, security systems, whether it's sanction support, whether it is econo crucially economic support, and we just saw that Janet Yellen was, uh, was in uh, Ukraine um, and, you know, with a pretty big assistance package for uh, direct <laughs> budgetary support. Um, but you know, it still isn't enough, and so, you know, the, what I came away with was that as reassuring and as important, um, the tagline, you know, we are with you for as long as it takes, was in the beginning and, you know, for, for many, many months. I think we need to update that tagline. I think we need to update it to say, we are with you and we will provide as much as you need, as quickly as you need it, so that Ukraine can win because I think winning is absolutely critical. It's important for Ukraine uh, to keep that country intact. Um, the Ukrainian people, and culture and language um, as it is today um, and going into the future. Um, but it's also important for, um, I think, the world system because if Russia is um, victorious, if Russia is rewarded with territory, um, Ukrainian territory that it seized illegally, Russia will keep on going um, beyond Ukraine. And President Putin has told us that in his writings, in his speeches, and I think we need to take him at his word. And that would be a real problem, um, not only for Ukraine, um, not only for Europe, but for the United States and the international system. This would be in contradiction to the values that um, you know, all countries, including the Soviet Union and then, the, and then Russia, signed up to in the UN system and in numerous treaties and uh, agreements. Um, and it would be, um, I think, a real blow to international security, certainly the US. The international system that was established after World War II, again, not news to this audience, um, has, uh, has, uh, is not perfect, uh, needs updating, um, but it has kept us um, more secure, more free, and more prosperous than any, at any other time in human history. That's really interesting, and it's very interesting, especially to hear about the impact on the people there, how they're very resilient and they're very determined, but also tired. Mm -hmm. One other thing you hear a lot about in the news is, um, you mentioned Putin is trying to erase Ukraine, get rid of mm -hmm. Ukraine, and he's talked a lot about how Ukraine isn't really 
distinct or different from Russia. Um, but you hear on the news when people are being interviewed, they talk about how this war has really made Ukraine and united Ukraine. Did you sense that difference between now and, say, when you were ambassador there? Um, well, I, I, I sense the difference more um, between, um, so I was in, in Ukraine as the number two at our embassy from 2001 to 2004. So 2001 was 10 years after independence. Ukraine still sort of forming itself. Um, and um, when I came back in 2016 as ambassador, that's when I really noticed it. And I think it's just become stronger ever since. And I'll, I'll give you two examples uh, of that. Um, one is, um, you know, everybody knows the Ukrainian um, shirt with the beautiful, beautiful embroidery. They're called Vishivankas. And when I was there the first time in the early 2000s, nobody really wore them. You know, that was something your grandmother made you wear in the villages, and you didn't really want to, you know, be seen in that in Kyiv. Um, when I came back in 2016, everybody was wearing them, and you can see that they are still wearing them. It, it, it is now a symbol of pride in Ukrainian culture, and justifiably so. Um, the other example um, I would give you is that, you know, um, uh, the 4th of July is the biggest event when you are a diplomat overseas. We give a big party. We invite, in this case, all the Ukrainians and various other people. And at the residence in Kyiv, there's what I call the, the Juliet balcony, where the ambassador sort of addresses the assembled throng in the garden. And, um, you know, when I was there the first time, um, I was on the balcony with the ambassador. And, um, you know, our national anthem was played, and, you know, all the Americans sang along, and they put their hand on their heart. Uh, when the Ukrainian anthem was played, nobody knew the words. Uh, when I came back in 2016, um, you know, same thing on the American anthem and on the Ukrainian anthem, everybody knew the words, everybody sang along, a lot of people put their hands on their hearts. And you can see that, you know, at various gatherings. And it is very, very touching. And just one short, brief little follow-up, just because I, myself, having been a Russia watcher for years mm -hmm. and now watching Ukraine, I've been struck by the number of Ukrainians who are Russian speakers. Yes. Do you find that the knowing of the anthem and the feeling of Ukrainianness extends beyond any sort of linguistic divide? Yes. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, you know, unfortunately, some people are now, um, well, fortunately, unfortunately, um, um, because of the war, um, many Russian speakers are now transitioning to Ukrainian um, uh -huh. because, you know, again, as a sign as a, um, um, of their patriotism and of their um, pride in their culture and language. Um, so I think we're going to see uh, less and less Russian uh, over, over time because of Russia's aggressive actions. Uh -huh. Yeah, thank you very much. It's good to hear about their determination and the importance of our support for their effort. It is, it is critical. Um, the, like I said, the Ukrainians are confident of victory. Um, the question is, at what cost? And we in the United States, in the international community, have the ability to reduce that cost greatly. And so, you know, let's just get on with it. Let's get them the weapons they need to um, ensure victory. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to work my way down, so yeah, I'll go to Marie, um, Dr. Snegovaya next. Um, first, it's really great to have you here. I know you're an expert on um, you're you're an expert on a lot of things, but one of the things in our, one of our earlier conversations that I really enjoyed talking to you about was um, what's going on inside of Russia with the Russian population, um, and so it'd be really valuable to have your insights on how the war in Ukraine is impacting Russian society. If you could describe the sentiment in Russia around the war and how people in Russia get their information, what they understand. Sure. Um, I'd say in a lot of ways uh, what we see and how the Russian public responds to this war, uh, in a lot of ways it's similar to what we've seen in the past because this is unfortunately by far not the first war Putin started during his re rule or reign. Uh, at the same time, there's differences. So where it's similar, uh, Russians usually tend to rally around the flag <coughs> every sing single time Putin starts the war. Uh, we see the spikes in approval for Putin every time, like starting with the uh, second war in Chechnya. And, uh, well, people can argue, right, you can not, the polls are not entirely reliable in Russia today, but we've seen the same situation happening before. In this sense, this is not new. After the war, Putin's approval has spiked, and so did other 
um, uh, ratings of all the other authorities because these all things are correlated in Russia uh, these days. At the same time, one thing I have to say that we come to realize this time that we haven't fully understood before is how important uh, for Russians is this sense of belonging to this greater whole, uh, which unfortunately tends to dominate other considerations like uh, personal economic insecurity, you know, all this uncertainty is being uh, sort of, uh, you know, thrown away for the sake of this idea of belonging and rallying around this uh, political leader. Uh, Putin, of course, has also over the years established this um, uh, position in the Russian society where he is the leader of the Russian foreign policy and he's making Russia great again, effectively. Um, and uh, this legitimacy that he's got, he's using in this war in order essentially to sustain uh, this support. Uh, this is in a lot of ways similar to what we've seen before. What is new is the underlying sort of the components that constitute the support. Uh, because if you look at Crimea uh, back in 2014, uh, for example, the underlying sentiment was uh, we did it, uh, Crimea is ours, it's great, everybody was enthusiastic and the society was actually unified in this, you know, almost an inspiration, you know, of how cool um, they felt they were. Uh, this is no longer the case. While we still see the same sort of rallying around the political leader, the underlying emotions are stress, anxiety, uncertainty, reluctance, People also actually have trouble to name one particular reason why Russia is actually taking part in this war, military operation. Actually, increasingly, people in Russia call this war a war. Even if some people went to jail for <laughs> saying that, now it's fine. Yeah, this is typical Russia. Uh, so, but uh, when asked like why, what, what, what is this for? Uh, the, people actually tend to get lost, uh, maybe. And if you actually look at the official narratives by the Kremlin propaganda, they also sort of tend to be running out of excuses, right? It used to be protecting the Russian speakers in Ukraine, denatification, demilitarization of Ukraine, desatanization, my personal favorite. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, essentially, even in the polls, you see that people actually are lost as to what we are doing there. And uh, in the long term, this might be good news uh, because it suggests that it will be probably harder for the Kremlin to sustain this crafted majority as opposed to what we've seen back in 2014 when the effect of Crimean annexation, uh, as you might remember, created the so-called Teflon, uh, Teflon rating for Putin. So Putin's rating skyrocketed and stayed there mm -hmm. for a while. Now, having said that, the unfortunate reality also underlying this rating dynamic is that in the Russian society, uh, based on the like very crude numbers, you've got seven to fifteen percent of people with liberal, more pro-Western beliefs, maybe twenty to thirty percent of more hawkish imperialist status groups, but then there is. 30 to 40 percent of something that's called swamp, maybe not the nicest term, <laughs> uh, yeah. but essentially people who go with the flow, right? They just would support anything that the state does, unfortunately, uh, for now. And this has been consistently the case under Putin's rule. And unfortunately, this group tend to quite uncritically align with most of this state, of what they perceive being the status quo. So it's not completely impossible to take the support away from Putin, but it's going to take a while. And without their support, the more pro-Western liberal groups, they essentially, they remain a minority. And this has been the consistent problem uh, throughout Putin's rule. Just to give you the example, um, how it works, how propaganda crafts uh, these minorities, uh, th this majority, I'm sorry. Uh, back in 2015, when Putin enters Syria with um, uh, military support for Assad, at first, m the majority of the society say, we don't need this, we don't want another Afghanistan, what are we doing in Syria? And the ratings approximately, like 60% are skeptical about this, 30% say, all right, let's do it. In two, and afterwards, TV propaganda start brainwashing. Two, week la two weeks later, you've got uh, absolute turnaround. You've got 60% uh, of people saying, yes, sure, that's such a great idea. We need to back up Assad against uh, the, the US, the West. And 30% remain skeptical. What happened in those two weeks? 
this uh, kind of group of uncertain uh, people who go with the flow essentially switched. And this is generally how usually the state propaganda crafts uh, these majorities, and this is just a very important nature of the Russian society that's important to understand. Now, um, broadly speaking, the support for uh, the war since Putin started it, despite all these underlying components, right, it remained at the level from, say, 60 to 70 percent. It varies by, uh, by uh, a pool. I'm not the one to say that you can fully cannot trust the, the pools in Russia. I think with a degree, degree of skepticism and adjusting to possible um, problems, you certainly can rely on certain numbers just to get you the general understanding of um, uh, what things look like in Russia, especially given the fact that we don't really see the opposite, right? There's no major anti-war protests inside Russia. You could argue that's because of the repressions, but we also don't see similar anti-war movement emerging anywhere outside of Russia, unfortunately, which suggests that the society is generally okay, right? They're not very happy, they're anxious, but that's fine. Another interesting thing uh, that emerged since the war started is this actually strife for normality, mm -hmm. strive for things to go back to normal. Mm -hmm. Now, throughout the last war, the major decline in uh, support for this war was not, unfortunately, induced by the West, Western sanctions, or development um, uh, in development in Ukraine, as well as as much as it was actually done by Putin himself when he announced mobilization. Mobilization was highly unpopular in the Russian society, according to all of the evidence that we have before. And once it was announced, indeed, Putin's approval of the Kremlin's multiple ratings of the authorities and the vision of the country's direction, uh, they all dropped. But only for a couple of weeks. Even in such a major development, when Russians can no longer pretend this is the war that happened somewhere else, right? Where some of the people being literally caught in the streets of Moscow and taken into, and taken into Ukraine, even in, those, uh, in that situation, you see the public opinion, yeah, reluctantly acknowledge that things are not okay, but only for a couple of weeks, only for them to go back to normal and say, yes, things are still fine. And this is something that's actually surprising even for long-term observers of Russian public opinion trends, to what extent this demand for normality, for things to go back to normal, and this like mm -hmm. an attempt to close your eyes and not see anything, uh, has been persisting in, persistent in the uh, public opinion trends over the last uh, year. So that's another interesting characteristics. Right now, if you look at the polls, there's a lot of optimism about the future. People say uh, Russia is going to be fine. The economy is going to go back to normal. Everything is great. Why are you even asking me this question? Well, what, what is, it? is there something going on? Why? <laughs> uh, so uh, this is another unfortunate sort of element of the public opinion, which suggests that it will take for Russia a while for Russia to sort of come to terms with what uh, makes sense of the catastrophe Putin got it into. I mean, that's, that's fascinating and it raises a lot of interesting, all of that raises a lot of interesting questions about the future because whatever happens in this war, Russia is still going to be there and it's still going to be where it is and countries are going to have to coexist with it at the very least. And so it raises some questions about, you know, um, yeah. how do you deal, I mean, what does it mean for the future if you have an apathetic mass who just wants to return to normalcy? Are they, are they accept, and we don't know which of the propaganda lines they believe. Do they believe Ukraine is not a state, as Putin keeps saying, that it's not distinct from Russia? Or do they believe that Ukraine is a mere puppet of NATO in the West? Or do they just not care as long as they personally are not affected? And what does that mean going forward for relations with Russia? Yeah, as I said, again, broadly construed, there's three groups, right? And depending on who you ask, they'll, you'll probably get slightly different uh, responses. So the hawkish uh, group will say Ukraine is not a state, or Ukraine is just a Russian puppet. I think this is more perhaps typical of the younger generation. The fact that Ukraine is not a state is something I would imagine all the groups tend to believe, right? The ones who remember the Soviet times and like Putin himself, right? They sort of used to this concept of you know, Russia being, the Soviet Union being this empire, 
um, for younger groups, uh, Ukraine is a state, very much a state. Uh, but there, of course, they still can be brainwashed by this idea that uh, Ukraine essentially is. It's not the war with Ukraine, it's the war with NATO or the United States. Um, it's different as, propaganda for different groups. Yeah. And uh, the propaganda works also in this way, you know, of course, right? The way it actually also does in the West. They throw different narratives at the public, and it's honestly, you, if, uh, when you turn on Russian TV, it actually gives you a false impression that there is a variation of opinions, except that the variation of opinions <laughs> goes yeah. all the way, as has been said before, from red to dark brown, right? <laughs> In the sense that it's from uh, uh, essentially some crazy proto-communist ideas to all the way complete Nazism. Yeah. Uh, but there's not, liberalism is lacking there, right? So yes, for some groups, some ideas work, for others, something else works. And this is one of the reasons why people can't really give you a straightforward answer. What is it that Russia is actually doing in Ukraine? What, what are we trying to achieve there? Uh, and um, uh, the other point I wanted to mention is um, uh, there's also this group, as I said, which the so-called swamp, which just changes, goes with the flow, and it's going to be probably communicating the last uh, line that they've heard over TV channels the day before. So their opinion essentially tends to fluctuate. And then, of course, there's liberals, but they're uh, a minority. In the recent uh, months, there was this trend that when asked for possible solutions of this uh, problem, of this conflict, um, increasing number of Russians actually emphasize uh, the importance of peace negotiations, uh, over 50% at some point. Hmm. But unfortunately, it also varies. Uh, when you ask them, like, this is what President Putin does, wants to do. What do you think? Mm. They tend to go with Putin, whatever Putin wants. So this, um, you know, the importance of the state, the Putin knows better. I'm just an ordinary small man. Let the big adults in the Kremlin Sorry. decide. Uh, this, unfortunately, is still there, uh, which suggests that the impact, I would say, the, of the, the impact of the economic um, sanctions just has not been fully felt uh, by the society as yet. So they still have this can afford this flexibility to delegate this authority to, to decide to the Kremlin. I would venture a guess that this might change as they personally experience the consequences of the war and subsequent crisis. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's all very fascinating, a lot to think about. Um, Dr. Howard, I've enjoyed working with you the past year and your thoughts on the international system, which is something that Ambassador Yovanovitch referenced, was the impact of this war on that. Um, so it would be great if you could talk about how the war in Ukraine has impacted the international system, especially the foundational principles of the UN Charter and international norms, and what challenges it's, it's presented going forward. Thanks so much, Mary. Um, yeah, I, you mentioned in your very generous introduction um, that I started my career in Soviet studies and then studied Soviet constitutional law from 91 to 92 when it was pretty challenging to study a constitution in a country that no longer <laughs> had a constitutional system. Um, uh, and then since then, you know, I've built a career in academia and um, especially studying war, how wars end, how people try to make them end, peacekeeping. And so these two bookends of my career are coming together here at USIP this year. Well, I've been working with Mary and everyone on the Russia-Ukraine team, and it's been a tremendous privilege. So thank you so much. It's, it's been a great year. Um, yes, so we have, you referenced norms, international law, and institutions. And I, you know, I've been teaching at Georgetown for 19 years, so I have to put my professorial cap on for a moment and talk about those different categories. So we have norms, which are expectations of how things ought to be. And then we have international law, and then we have the institutions that help uphold the law. But so there are sort of s different stages. Um, we have here uh, an international norm of non-aggression that arose really after World War I, abolished during World War II essentially, but strengthened after World War II, that states ought not to use force to change borders. So there's this norm, this idea that that should be this way, uh, we and the rest of uh, the world build this, this system of international law, and that is upheld by international institutions to make sure that states don't go to war with one another, and when they do, that they end quickly. And one thing I've 
During my research uh, over the course of this year, I've noted that there is no state in the world that has had its borders that it has now forever. Right? Every state has had different borders, and many states in the international system have border disputes. So since World War II, when there's a border dispute, 50 times, five zero times, when we have a militarized interstate dispute that started to move to aggression, it's gone to the UN Security Council and de-escalated. So about, we could have had about 50 more interstate wars since World War II than we've had. Why it's so important to uphold the norms, the laws, and the institutions, because interstate wars kill a lot of people. We know that's from history. And that's, that's why all states decided together that when we want to change borders, we're going to do it not using a military aggression. So what Russia has done now is violated the norms the laws and undermine the institutions that uphold these principles. So Russia has committed not only the crime of aggression, Putin's Russia, I should say. It's not all of Russia. And you can't blame all Russians, right? This is Putin's imperial kleptocratic Russia. It's his decision to violate the norm and the law of, of aggression. Um, we also have violations of the laws of war, how you conduct yourself during war, right? So we have war crimes, crimes against humanity, and then also uh, significant charges of genocide. So we have a serious undermining of all of these principles of international law and how states ought to behave. And it's not to say that all states have behaved perfectly in the US, you know, there's a lot of whataboutism, but the point is that Russia has gone all out defying all of them at the same time, and there's no stopping it, really, other than through military force. So part of what we've been trying to talk about this year is, is there a way to stop Russia without using military force? And it's very hard at the US Institute of Peace to come to the realization that it is, it is almost inconceivable to figure out how to end this without militarily removing Russia's forces from Ukraine. Um, Okay, so we have, this is mainly the negative impacts on the international system is what we're talking about. There are a couple of other negative impacts and then I wanna talk about some inklings of positive impacts. <laughs> so we wanna hear those. <laughs> okay, right. <laughs> um, we saw at the G20 and G7 um, meetings last week in, in India that as both of you referenced, um, we don't have very much support for the international sanctions. 32 countries have signed on to the US and EU sanctions. And this, so we have this emerging divide in the international political economy. The sanctions aren't really working. So that this is another instrument of foreign policy to try to figure out how to change a country's behavior. The sanctions aren't really working. So we move to, uh, from military to sanctions to shaming. And in that sense, uh, moving on to something of a silver lining, shaming is the main mechanism the UN can use right now. So because, the, because Russia has a veto on the UN Security Council, the UN Security Council's hands are tied. And so the decision making on Russia has shifted to the General Assembly to the world parliament. It's not really a world parliament, but every country gets a vote in the General Assembly. And last year around this time, the General Assembly took a vote and 141 countries condemned Russia for its aggression in, in Ukraine. And on the first anniversary of the war, again, we had 141 countries in the world condemning Russia for its aggression in Ukraine. So in that sense, we have, that, that is the, that is the real world material uh, evidence of a norm that states should not use force against each other. That they, you know, uh, most countries in the world agree that Russia should not be doing this in Ukraine. Now, when it comes to actually imposing costs on Russia, that's where we see less agreement about how to impose costs, and there is a divide, uh, as we all know. Um, but it's still not, Russia still doesn't have that much support. 
six countries voted with Russia. Five countries voted last time, six countries voted this time, right? And it's, it's a collection of pariah states, but I noted that even, even, even Cuba and Iran didn't vote with Russia this time, <laughs> right? So <laughs> um, it, there is a sense that the norm still holds that you shouldn't use force. Um, Mary, you have also uh, written for the USIP website, right, that in order for this to change, and Marie, you, you, you referenced this also to a certain extent, in order for this situation to change, Russia has to give up the imperial mindset the way that every European power has done over the past 70 or so years. Right, so every, if you think of all the European land empires from the Ottoman Empire to the Swedish Empire, the Bulgarian Empire, Austro-Hungary, the French Empire, uh, the Prussian, uh, United Kingdom, so many countries, German, um, so many countries in Europe had land empires and they were forced to a certain extent through military, but also through the emergence of this norm that one ought not to have imperial ambitions. And that is the mindset, that's the norm that would be the basis of the change of Russia's behavior. And so it's a question of how to convince, probably not Putin and his, and his collection of friends, but the next leaders of Russia um, to, to, to give up the imperial mindset as every other European power has done, that you can't take your neighbor's territory. Um, you've also pointed out that uh, Putin has a history of backing down. <laughs> so there, that might also be a possibility. Um, but I think just, just to conclude, um, I think that it's possible to envision a day when Russia's ambitions will fade and that we could come back to a normal way of life, both you know, internally for Russia and in the international system, because it's in everyone's interest to have a rogue Russia, as you've pointed out in your book, Ambassador Ivanovich, that, that this, this is, it, a rogue Russia threatens not only Russia and its neighbors, but also us internally, anyone who, anyone Russia seeks to disrupt. Um, so how to, how to shift that mindset and then bring Russia in? That's the question I'm interested in figuring out how to answer. Thanks. Um, I think I have two interrelated and probably unanswerable questions, but <laughs> I'll throw them at you anyway. Yeah. Um, first, so you mentioned the imperial mindset, and one of the things that I've thought is that this war between Ukraine, this war of Russia against Ukraine, really reminds me of um, a, colonial, a colonial power with its colonies wanting to assert itself as, as an independent state. And that what, is what I see Ukraine as sort of trying to decolonize from Russia, an extension of the collapse of the Soviet Union and the Russian Empire. Um, and that tracks what you said about the history of imperial powers in Europe. Why then is it so hard for, why does it seem so hard for us to convince the global south that not, not so much to support Russia, but it seems Russia is very heavily courting the Global South and a lot of their messages resonate with the Global South. With this anti-imperial and anti-colonialist um, adventure, why is it that they're not supporting Ukraine more? It's complicated. <laughs> I <know>. um, <laughs> yeah, I don't think there are easy answers. Um, Russia's very good at disinformation. I think we all know that. Um, and the early images coming out of the war from Kharkiv of, of non-white students, especially from the Global South, not being allowed to board trains to leave Kharkiv, even though they're leaving trains because of the Russian invasion. The image spoke to um, a different issue which, which is bigotry that exists in all societies um, and also in Ukraine. So that image, I think, set a lot of people's minds about Ukraine, people who hadn't heard about Ukraine. And I think it's been, frankly, I think it's been hard to shake that, that founding, like that first exposure to the war 
And I, I don't know how, um, I think talking about abstract concepts of international law sound very disingenuous, especially coming from the former colonizers. Uh, so it's a, in my mind, it's, a, it's almost a matter of reframing the conversation. I mean, I see this war as like in terms of David and Goliath, <laughs> right? I mean, and, but this, in this case, David needs, as, as Zelensky was saying just a couple of weeks ago, in this case, David needs more than a, than a slingshot. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Did you wanna? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I agree, Russia is great at disinformation. And one example is that, um, uh, you know, in, in much of Africa, Russia has successfully planted the notion that um, the um, wheat shortages, et cetera, are because of U.S. sanctions. Not because Russia invaded Ukraine and did everything that we saw and blockaded the grain shipments. It's because of U.S. actions. And we, um, you know, I mean, we're trying, but we are just not as successful at planting, um, not planting, but sharing the truth and um, sharing our own narrative. And, you know, as studies have shown, once somebody has heard something that, you know, this is because of U.S. action and Western sanctions, it's very hard to turn that around. And even if you can turn it around in the short term, six months later, they're back to it's the fault of the U.S. Right. Um, I do think, though, that there are, um, you know, and I agree, the images of, um, of um, people from other countries being turned away, it looked like racism. Um, and um, that was hard. And it was hard here in the United States. I had a lot of people asking me about that. Um, you know, to their credit, the Ukrainian government turned that around relatively quickly, but the damage was done. But more broadly, um, I think that countries in the global south um, wonder why this war is different from every other war. Right. You know, because as we know, there are all sorts of conflicts all over the world, and yet there hasn't been the same kind of response. And so, um, I mean, I think, you know, probably uh, not enough time to go into why this one is different. Um, but I think that people, you know, just kind of wonder and, and wonder whether we care about them at all. And, you know, it's closer to um, the former Soviet Union as well. I mean, my friends in Armenia want to know why, um, why the U.S. didn't intervene and, and Europe intervene in the same way because surely Azerbaijan was, you know, the aggressor, et cetera. I know there's a different side to the story as well, but, you know, I hear from the Armenian side. And um, so I think, you know, I think that's something that we need to um, address mm -hmm. um, and address head on. Um, and I think that, um, you know, there's a general lament about the lack of diplomacy, et cetera, but actually there's a lot of diplomacy going on. And I think we can see it in some of, um, you know, the high level visits of, um, U.S. Um, leaders, um, including uh, Dr. Jill Biden, uh, going to Africa last week. Um, I think, you know, uh, Secretary Blinken's uh, travel to Central Asia, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that we are present, we, um, we um, are partners with, um, you know, much of the world, and we want to be there and be supportive. Yeah, that's a really good point. And with Putin essentially trying to blow up the international system, um, and our belief, and I think our, our correct belief, that the international system is good for the world, maybe we need to examine how to make sure that it really is good for everybody in the world. Hmm. Um, maybe advance that, like you said, show our understanding of ways that we might need to reform it a bit yeah. to ensure that. But blowing it up is, is definitely, I think, not the way to go. <laughs> um, do we have any questions from the um, online audience yet? We have a couple of Hello? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so we have a couple of questions. So the first one is, what does a victory look like for Ukraine, and in other words, for Ukraine to win? Great. Any of you can answer that or all? I could try, and then we'll see what the rest of us think. Um, I, th I think a victory for Ukraine is simply to, to, to have the Russian troops leave. Um, that's kind of the, the, to restore the 1991 borders. Recall that Ukraine has had voting status in the UN General Assembly since its founding. So those borders have been recognized for an awfully long time. Crimea came a little bit later, but that is, that is an internationally recognized territory. Um, that, that, and the, if we're talking about the principle of sovereignty, that in my mind would be, 
um, victory for Ukraine, right? So victory for Russia, as, as we said, as Ambassador Yovanovitch said, is russifying or killing Ukrainians, right? Taking over Ukraine. So victory on either side looks a little bit different. What happens next? So there's victory for Ukraine, and then there's winning the peace, mm -hmm. right? So if, if we have a forever hostile Russia trying to take over Ukraine and its neighbors forever, then that, that victory will be, it won't be hollow. It would be incredibly important, but it wouldn't guarantee a longer term peace. And so that is the question, is how, how to ensure, ensure a longer term peace, which I'm not gonna take the floor forever. I have some ideas about that, but I'd like to hear from the rest of us. <laughs> we'll have to have another event. <laughs> completely uh, echo everything that you've said, mm -hmm. um, except that one concerning point I wanted to add is that there appears to be some strategic ambiguity, I'd say, on this part of the West when defining the victory mm -hmm. for Ukraine, right? Everybody would answer typically, it's for Ukraine to decide. It's not our place to make that decision. But unfortunately, it is, mm -hmm. because we all understand that the Western support plays an incredibly important role in how this war unravels further. And I think having a clear vision and goals in this war, uh, which ex define exactly what it means for Ukraine to win, going back to the borders of, say, February 23 uh, last year, or maybe uh, 1991 borders, I think it would have helped a lot to make the um, policies towards uh, Ukraine more effective in the sense of provision of the necessary uh, help that's already been done on unprecedented levels, but unfortunately still, uh, as Marcia mentioned before, not enough to fully uh, sustain uh, Ukraine's, uh, uh, Ukraine's success. Uh, so from that perspective, I think a lot depends on how the West acts and what it is that, you, uh, that and how the West defines uh, the victory. It's very important that these definitions are clear. Mm. Yeah, I um, agree. I had to debate a Russian on Sky News Arabic mm. and they were continuing, they, they were just expressing this nonsense that the goal was to destroy Russia. And that's not the goal. I think victory for Ukraine, and from the U.S. perspective, victory for Ukraine would be that, that Ukraine gets back its territorial integrity and its sovereignty. And that's it. It's a very defensive, but important it's goal. Security. Yeah, and it's security, yeah. Winning the peace is going to be key because um, I don't think anyone wants a situation where Ukraine has to remain armed like a porcupine forever to defend itself. There has to be some sort of way that it can live peacefully and prosperously and securely in the future. And that may unfortunately involve a porcupine for a while, but security is absolutely key. Do we have any questions from the audience? Hi, thank you. Michelle Kellerman with NPR. Um, when um, China made some proposals um, about a, a peace plan or peace proposals, whatever you want to call them, the U.S. response was basically that um, China is not an honest broker. I wonder if you see any honest brokers out there. Um, could other countries play more of a role and convince Russia to to give up its imperial ambitions, as you say? Um, it could be countries like India or the UN, do you see anybody that could be an honest broker? I would like to that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can take a stab at it. it it's, it's hard to see right now because I think the, the sides are so polarized and there's not a lot of mutual trust going on uh, or even confidence. And so I think that as this, um, um, you know, as, as um, developments occur, it will probably become clearer. I would also note that, at least initially, um, Zelensky didn't dismiss the Chinese peace proposal out of hand. Um, he said, interesting, I want to see the whole plan, you know, I want to talk to the Chinese about it, and, um, you know, latched on to um, the issue of territorial integrity. Um, seeing that, uh, which was uh, in the peace plan, which he had not yet seen, but had heard about, and he said, you know, clearly that means um, that the Chinese are, um, you know, open to our position, which is that Ukraine needs to have, you know, its its um, its um, its legal borders um, uh, observed um, by all countries, including Russia. So um, I think 
I think as, you know, neither Russia nor Ukraine um, is ready for peace talks right now. Um, but as we see developments on the ground, um, as hopefully Ukraine gets a, you know, a stronger position militarily, um, I think we'll also see evolving um, you know, what uh, various states propose and how that might come together in what is hopefully a, um, a, a constructive mix of um, negotiations. I will, oh. I mean, when Ukraine is ready. Sorry, I just had to say that. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, so one more uh, thing I wanted to add to that is that, uh, and going back to the discussion of the role of the global south, right? We see consistently that one of the reasons why sanctions are not as effective as they could have been, right? I wouldn't say they don't work, they just not work as effectively as we hoped. Uh, is of course the help of the uh, major countries in avoiding them. And China, Turkey, India are the crucial players on the international stage that actually help Russia uh, sustain uh, decent uh, status quo, especially by purchasing <coughs> energy resources, but also by providing routes to uh, smuggle the um, uh, products, articles that are otherwise sanctioned uh, by the West. That's, by the way, one of the reasons why I would argue Global South is also is not, not very eager to side with Ukraine, because why abandon all these prolific opportunities? <laughs> In the post-Soviet space, for example, you see uh, almost a competition emerging among all these inter different countries like Kazakhstan, Armenia, Georgia, and others, competing of who is going to be the main sanction avoidant routes for, for all these articles. And I mean, and you're pro offering for them to give up all these uh, lucrative opportunities, like for what? So from that perspective, working with these countries obviously becomes the key uh, issue for mm -hmm. the US foreign policy making. It's also good to see that the administration actually is on board with that, right, based on the trips yeah. of the US administration. Exactly. So I, I would just say, I, I'm not a sanctions expert. I'm mean, need Dan Freed or somebody like that here. Um, you know, clearly sanctions, you know, I think everybody hoped that sanctions would be a magic bullet and we would see, you know, real effects on the uh, Russian economy that would lead to peace sooner rather than later. Um, I think there are effects on the Russian uh, economy, um, including, you know, on the all important energy sector in terms of, you know, the amount they're selling, the amount they're getting for, uh, for uh, um, those products and you know, how much they're getting in taxes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think that sanctions are always a long-term tool. You know, we are Americans, and so we want you know, results yesterday. <laughs> That's not the way sanctions work. And especially, I mean, the steps that the international community has taken with regard to Russia um, and sanctions are unprecedented. We've never sanctioned such a big economy. And so we put in um, place uh, a number of sanctions and we kept on putting in place sanctions. And we are continuing to do so. And Janet Yellen spoke about that when she was, uh, she was in Ukraine. And now we are seeing the loopholes that you guys have, have mentioned. And so we are trying to go after, after those as well. And we are learning, you know, just as, you know, uh, uh, People who are trying to avoid sanctions are learning. We are learning as well. And I think that um, you know, the vice is going to get tighter and tighter and tighter over time. And so that, again, um, you know, we need to do these things as quickly as possible because the price Ukraine is paying for fighting for its freedom as well as ours is very high. I'll take a stab at it also, mm -hmm. uh, echoing to a certain extent what we've heard. Um, but also, you know, putting on my, my professor hat again. We have like five or six major studies that show that with the promise of, a, of third party impartial monitoring that you're more likely to have a peace agreement. So I think it's worth talking, even though the goal now for the West and of course for Ukraine is, is to reestablish Ukrainian borders, what happens then? Um, so, with the promise of some kind of external monitoring, it's more likely that you will have some kind of agreement that both sides will adhere to. And that would, that would mean, as you suggested, some kind of impartial uh, leader to, to lead the mediation and then es establish some kind of mechanism to oversee the, the, keep, the keeping of the peace. Uh, and you mentioned India. 
Um, India has significant ties with all of these parties. India has a long tradition of UN peacekeeping. It's often the number one sender of UN peacekeepers, has an incredibly professional army, well-trained, um, adept at these issues. I, I'd note that India has the longest standing uh, peacekeeping outpost on the border between Syria and Israel and Lebanon, for example. That's one of the oldest UN peacekeeping bases. But so in, in my mind, that would be a logical route, uh, noting also that India's second largest trading partner is the United States. India has significant um, and building economic ties right now with Russia, obviously a border dispute with China, but there are still reasons why it's in everyone's interest to make sure that there's some kind of impartial um, observer of, uh, of what comes next. Thank you. Do you have any other questions? Um, uh, my name is Hiro Patanabe. Um, I'm a correspondent of Japanese newspaper Sankei Shinbun. Um, my question is maybe about the picture of victory. Um, so um, President Biden or uh, Biden administration's official keep saying uh, the US or West uh, support Ukraine as long as it takes or uh, U.S. support Ukraine to defend itself, but uh, they look uh, still reluctant to mention the victory of Ukraine. Why don't they say the U.S. West uh, support help Ukraine to win this war as soon as possible? Maybe they are still um, worry about some escalation or they are maybe seeking some possibility, as doctor said, some impartial player will be involved, but I just want to ask what the administration um, characterizes the picture of a victory in this moment. Thank you. Want to take that question? Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, really, uh, that's a question for the White House, right. mm -hmm. um, uh, not, uh, not so much for us. But um, I, I, I will just share my own opinion that it's really important. You, you mentioned several possible reasons uh, why, um, why uh, this might be so. Um, I think it's important not to self-deter. You know, we need to decide what our own goals are. We need to work with allies, uh, obviously, first and foremost, with our, our, our partner, Ukraine, on, uh, on what this means. And I think it's, um, while I agree um, that uh, we have a, a really serious stake in terms of what the outcome is on this, including whether we stay the course with Ukraine, because other countries are watching. And other countries are taking lessons, as is Russia. Because if Russia prevails, if Russia wins, Russia will keep on going. So we, we have a huge stake in this. And we have a huge stake in Ukraine prevailing. Um, but I also think that if, um, you know, there are always rumors that countries are out there pressuring Ukraine to start negotiating, to give, give in to various Russian demands. And I was just reading an article this morning that um, Russia's like, you know, we're ready to negotiate. Uh, you know, Ukraine just has to concede that um, the territorial gains um, and, and, and then we're good. Well, you know, that's crazy. It's as though, you know, a, a robber came to your house and stakes out the bedroom and the living room and the police come in and say, you need to give the robber the bedroom and the living room because they're already here. <laughs> I mean, that just doesn't work. And it's not going to work in the case of Ukraine where, um, where we've already seen with the Minsk um, agreements um, where there was two efforts at peace. Russia kind of torpedoed both of them. And um, they did not last, uh, uh, they did not um, turn out uh, to be the forerunners of a lasting peace because they were not a true peace. And so we need to make sure that the conditions are set 
for their, uh, you know, once negotiations are in the right, uh, you know, when the conditions are set for a negotiation, that it is um, that it is a successful negotiation that doesn't just lead to a ceasefire, which is what we, in theory at least, had before, but it leads to peace where um, uh, Ukraine and, and Russia um, agree uh, that this is this is the way it's going to be into the future. Yeah. Um I would only add that I don't believe that as long as it takes and as soon as possible are mutually exclusive. Um, we can win this as soon as possible and we will be there as long as it takes. So I'm not speaking for the administration, but I don't see those as contradictory. Um, unfortunately, we're running out of time, I see from the clock here. Um, but it's been a really fascinating conversation and really rewarding and fruitful. And thank you all for your time. And um, I want to thank the audience as well for their really thought-provoking um, questions and for participating and listening. Um, and I hope that we can do this again. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.